Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those who are joining us for the first time, uh, my name is Rosa Stolteri, and I'm the Knowledge Mobilization Manager with CanCOVID and also your speaker series moderator. Um, so for today's speaker series, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Astrid Gutman. Dr. Gutman is a senior scientist at the Institute for Clinical and Evaluation, Evaluative Sciences, or ICES, as you know, and a clinical scientist at the SickKids Research Institute. Among her many projects, she is leading a CIHR funded project on optimizing Canada's healthcare for refugees. Dr. Gutman will be presenting to us a recent report on the implications of COVID-19 for immigrants and refugees and ongoing efforts at ICES to facilitate the use of this data to inform local responses. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Gutman. So thank you. Great, thanks very much, Rosa. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to um, talk about some of our work. And when I say our, um, you know, there's a really big team behind a lot of the work, um, a few names here. And if any of you are interested in our first report, um, I've uh, uh, highlighted where you can find it. Um, and I'll speak a little bit about, um, you know, the part of this that uh, was well influenced by um, the ICES Public Advisory Council. Um, I'll also just say I have no conflicts of interest to declare. So I, I thought I would start with two um, really important um, and particularly germane quotes by Sir Michael Marmot um, around health inequalities and social determinants of health are not the footnote, they're the main issue, um, and that they tell us a great deal about the good or bad effects of social policies. Um, and so what I'm going to do uh, for the next 20 minutes is first off just um, paint a little bit of context um, around uh, ICS and which is a well-established um, provincial research institute and data repository uh, in Ontario, highlight the work that we've been doing um, around immigrant and refugee communities, discuss the limitations of data that are available um, and the importance uh, to triangulate um, findings, um, to bring context to, uh, to reports and then just reflect a little bit, muse a little bit on um, the usefulness of these kinds of descriptive analyses and, and ways that we're trying to um, have more impact with some of our data. So just very briefly, ICS is an independent research institute. It's really a network across um, a majority of the universities in, um, in Ontario. And we are, um, we are a prescribed entity in Ontario's um, uh, health information legislation, which allows us to collect a vast array of sort of health data that are collected in the sort of day-to-day -day, um, workings of the health system. But we supplement these data with a number of other um, sometimes clinical registries, but also demographic uh, data. And so here you can see, you know, we have a number of other demographic data that we link to the healthcare data. Um, and one of these is the permanent resident database from our federal um, immigration um, ministry. Um, and this is just to um, really highlight the fact that, uh, you, know, we, you know, we have 260 scientists, we're, you know, a big operation, lots of peer review publications, but we also do a lot of evaluative work, many reports, scorecards, et cetera, for the Ministry of Health and for many other health system stakeholders. Um, and it's really in that context that, you know, much of our COVID-19 work has been conducted. Um, and so, you know, in the spring when everybody went into lockdown, um, we were deemed an essential service. Um, and we really pivoted very quickly from being a shop that integrated data, you know, some monthly, mainly quarterly, some annually to having daily data feeds of the um, SARS-CoV-2 test data um, fed into our data holding so that we could link it to all of the other clinical and demographic data that we had so that we could be producing reports. And we, for many, many months, were reporting daily, seven days a week, um, and then did more elaborate weekly reports to um, something called the Ontario Command Table, or it was called that at the time, um, to really just try to better understand, um, you know, uh, who, who was being tested, um, who was positive for the virus. And of course, much of our early work was focused on the long-term care setting, uh, trying to define other congregate um, living and high-risk settings, 
as well as really around, you know, a lot of the clinical um, features. So, you know, were most of those um, who um, were testing positive, were they, um, were they residents um, and Ontarians with a number of um, important comorbidities, et cetera. But fairly soon, you know, um, I mean, I, I can't remember exactly when, I, I'm gonna say April, um, you know, it became clear um, that this was just not just about clinical risk factors and, and equity and health equity really became um, important. And so, you know, initially we and many others, how's my flattening and um, public health um, Ontario started to take census-based measures of socioeconomic status um, and start to look at how cases were playing out. Um, and one of the, um, in Ontario, we have something called the Ontario Marginalization Index, which is made up of four different um, constructs. And one of them really reflects ethnic diversity. Um, and it's really a measure, it's based on census data and it reflects um, at the neighborhood level, um, neighborhoods um, um, that have high, uh, um, uh, proportion of residents who are new immigrants or those who self-identify on the long form as visible minorities. And what became clear, and this is Public Health Ontario's data on cases, was, you know, a very um, clear uh, gradient in terms of cases based on this. And some of this was really pointing us to geography. This was pointing us to urban areas, um, but it was much more than that. And at the same time, there was, you know, a huge amount of early um, epidemiologic um, data coming out of, of the US, the UK as well, France, um, um, with um, media attention focused on the disproportionate toll um, uh, uh, of um, infections in racialized communities, um, as well as um, uh, those um, with other uh, lower income um, uh, communities for a whole host of reasons, which I'll get into a little bit. Um, and then, you know, at the same time, there was a subgroup of um, this command table that were focused on vulnerable populations. Um, and so we had a request from the command table, as well as this vulnerable populations table, as well as the federal immigration ministry to use the linkage with the immigration data to describe whatever we could. And, and initially, we were just asked to, you know, in our demographic tables to just put another few lines, you know, immigrant, not immigrant. Um, and, um, and you know, we thought we, you know, we had some concerns, uh, you know, about that. Um, and really, you know, immigrants are a very diverse um, um, population in our country. And so just putting sort of a line in the table just did not seem um, you know, it didn't seem to be the, the right approach. We had some concerns as well about the lack of current contextual data. So in the immigration files that we have, we have quite a bit of um, demographic level of education, language, occupation, but that's at the time of immigration. Um, and we don't have those currently, or do we have those for, um, um, for um, Canadian born or long-term residents? The other piece was that um, we've been trying uh, more and more to really do our the work um, using immigration data in a community engaged fashion, and that's pretty hard when you have, you know, um, you know, when you're you're being asked to, you know, pump a report out pretty quickly. Um, and of course, all of this was, you know, we were very conscious of not wanting to, you know, stigmatize. So this is at the point where, you know, the virus is being called the China virus by, you know, the outgoing U.S. president. And we were just, you know, concerned and wanted to do this um, properly in a way that wasn't stigmatizing. So I'll just outline briefly our report. I mean, so the first thing we decided to do was to not include long-term care residents. The dynamics of um, infection um, is very different um, in these homes. And so we, we really wanted to stick with generally a community dwelling uh, population. Um, and we included all of those who had immigrated um, since the first um, data that we have in 1985. Um, and we also included second generation children if they were still um, under 18, um, you know, at this point. We decided to keep the report descriptive and I'm gonna amuse a little bit on that um, at the end. Um, and then, of course, we focus both on testing and cases. And, you know, this is important in any case. Um, you know, the testing uh, that's been done over time um, has been very dependent on capacity, on different um, strategies of the time of who to test, asymptomatic, symptomatic, um, but as well. And so interpreting case numbers um, 
um, you know, is of course, you know, very important to do in the context of testing rates. But the other thing is that we've done a lot of work over the years looking at access to healthcare services in general. And certainly we have shown that um, for many immigrant communities, there are barriers um, to care. And that was an important um, part of what we wanted to do. We did try to provide as much sociodemographic context um, as possible. And, and you'll see a little bit in particular, you know, um, immigration categories, um, you know, are very determined by, um, you know, the, the in part economic needs that um, immigrants fill, um, refugee trajectories are very different. And so all of that, um, you know, um, and is very related to country of origin and, and many of these things. So we wanted to provide as much reporting on that as possible. The other thing that we did is we have a public advisory um, council at ICES and uh, they were very interested in this work and a subgroup of them, uh, many of whom identify as um, immigrants or racialized um, Canadians um, really wanted to um, be involved and they were they provided us incredibly um, important advice all along uh, the way of doing this report. And then we did push back on the rush a little bit um, to really, you know, so that we had the time to do this properly and also provide, you know, background context um, and then recommendations. So this is just, I do not expect anybody to read the slide, but this is just to show a little bit that we really try to, you know, describe um, all the different categories of immigrants and the selection um, criteria. And at the same time, we also try to give a sort of current snapshot of, you know, um, immigrants by the categories um, on which they arrive. And so just as an example, because this will become important in some of the data that I'll show, you know, so economic caregivers. So this is a fairly small immigration category, predominantly female, um, the majority of them from Southeast Asia and, and mainly from the Philippines. Um, and with a very high of all of the groups of immigrants, very high percentage who at currently um, uh, not on arrival, but currently live in the lowest income neighborhoods in Ontario um, and in those that are very ethnically diverse. And so we tried to sort of paint the picture of the different um, streams of um, immigrants and their current sociodemographic context in as much as we could. So then just to get to sort of some of the findings, I mean, the bottom line is, um, you know, while, while immigrants and refugees and other newcomers make up uh, about a quarter of Ontario's population, and this is data through June, it's about the same, a little bit more, we've just rerun this for November, they account for, you know, almost 45%. So really a disproportionate burden. Across the board, uh, rates of testing uh, were lower um, across all immigrant and, and refugee uh, groups. And we've now done these analyses for three different public health units um, that have very, um, that are urban and um, have very high proportions of the population who are immigrants and refugees. And this is true even within, um, you know, even with it, within geographies where the rates of, of uh, you know, similar province. Um, but whereas, you know, testing was lower, um, we found again across the board percent positivity. So the percentage of those tests that are coming back positive, as well as per capita positivity higher across all immigration categories um, uh, it, um, as compared to Canadian born. So again, this is these were the June numbers across the board. Positivity is a little bit lower now because uh, we've been doing a lot more testing since June, but similar relationships. So you know, whereas Canadian-born long-term residents percent positivity about three uh, percent overall for immigrants and refugees, eight percent higher in refugees overall about ten percent. And this is what this looks like over time. Um, and this is then um, you know cases per capita by the different categories. And I'll just point out a couple. Um, so Canadian born are in the dotted lines there at the bottom. And here you can see um, this uh, light blue are um, economic caregivers. So a huge um, spike of cases um, in April, May, um, and then another spike here coinciding with, you know, large outbreaks in, in nursing homes. And then again, here in the fall, kind of coming right back up. Um, and then again, those who enter as refugees in purple consistently sort of higher. And, you know, as we've seen, I mean, we had all pretty low numbers over the summer and then here um, since September um, for a lot of different reasons, um, you know, we now are seeing again, um, you know, huge increases and much steeper increases than in the Canadian born population. When we looked at this by region, 
um, we showed that the highest percent positivity were in immigrants and refugees coming from regions where a majority would be considered racialized in Canada. So this is what that looks like, um, much higher. So this light blue is percent positivity of Canadian born, dark blue dotted line is um, all immigrants and refugees. And you can see here um, much higher in those coming from Africa, the Caribbean, South Asia, um, similar to Canadian born would be those coming from Europe, South Africa, East Asia, uh, Australasia. Um, and then we looked at it as well for recent immigrants and those who came as adults, um, you know, based on language ability and, you know, higher positivity in those um, who immigrate and um, do not speak either French or English and higher in those with um, less um, education and just a really clear gradient down as you get to those who are university educated. Um, and then finally, you know, I talked about the lack of, um, you know, occupational data. Um, we did link to um, public health test uh, data. And at that time, um, the only um, occupation data that was well characterized um, was that of healthcare workers. And we also um, show that, um, you know, employment as a healthcare worker, um, especially amongst women, accounts for a disproportionate number of cases um, amongst immigrants and refugees. So this is what this looks like. Um, you know, again, these are the June data, about half of the cases are in women, of, of the cases in women, um, you know, about a third are in healthcare workers, but of those healthcare workers, you know, almost, um, almost half are um, in, um, in immigrants and refugees. Um, and again, from, you know, a distinct set of um, countries that again, align very much with um, this group of um, immigrants who come as economic caregivers. So I've just given you, you know, a huge <laughs> data dump, all descriptive, um, you know, so what to make of this. And, um, you know, I, there, there of course, lots of work um, going on. Th these are data um, from Ontario uh, using ICES data as well, which have looked at a number of different area-based um, measures and explanatory variables to sort of try to understand, you know, some of the context that's leading to the disparities that I've shown. And here you can see, you know, that these are the unadjusted odds ratios um, fully adjusted odds ratios. And um, you can see that when you at the area level look at recent immigration category visible minority, you know, the disparities that you see, you know, kind of melt away. And, you know, once you adjust for things like household density and educational attainment, and this is a, a paper in, in preprint. Um, but I guess I would say that, um, you know, it's, of course, it's important to understand the mediators. And of course, it's important to understand what might explain these differences. But it doesn't take away from the fact that many communities bear a disproportionate burden of these risk factors. Um, and so these, this, these are data from Statistics Canada from 2016, where they've categorized occupations based on um, and you can see, and this is again based on, you know, these immigration categories that I've described to you, you know, here are the economic caregivers, fully 30% of them are employed in occupations that are deemed high risk as compared with 15% of the overall labor force, and that includes immigrants, so it would be even less if we took them out. Um, and then another two thirds of the caregivers are in the medium risk group. Similarly, you look at, you know, refugees. Um, you know, a high, high proportion, much higher proportion are in high risk occupations. Um, and, and again, it's, you know, even more complex than that. And so this was a newspaper article that came out when we um, did our report. And, you know, it focused on, you know, the story of, you know, one woman who um, came as an economic caregiver from the Philippines. She was a registered nurse there. Um, and she ended up getting sick. Uh, she now works as a personal support worker and got sick in, um, you know, in the spring. And this is what she said, you know, job security is not there at times because the position's not permanent and there are no benefits. So, you know, the, the complexity of, you know, why people are getting sick um, and, and how both, you know, trajectories of, um, you know, immigrants and post-settlement um, experience, um, occupational, um, you know, the, the, the needs we have for, 
um, immigrants is very, very complex. And so, you know, I've shown certainly, I think from our data, disproportionate burden of COVID-19 um, in some, not all immigrant and refugee populations, but these reflect very systemic issues, systemic inequities that lead to income disparities um, that put people at very high risk through occupation, housing and other factors. Um, and where you know we've shown that there's lower testing and, and high positivity in some populations, and that may you know that suggests barriers to accessing testing. Dealing with those barriers is not straightforward. So again, you know if you are a part-time employee with no sick leave, no benefits, um, you know then uh, you know not easy to be tested. If you don't have sick leave, you're not going to want to be tested. Um, you know in case you then need to. Uh, stay home and um, uh, stay home until uh, you're better. Many, many other, I think, um, issues as well. And so from a policy consideration, you know, we can get to the ones that are, you know, in the purview of public health. So more accessible testing, um, although that's not easy necessarily, mobile units can help, but are also stigmatizing. Um, public health units have done, you know, an incredible job, certainly um, in Ontario, um, two of the public health units have been very involved in um, um, lobbying the federal government for support to be able to, um, to isolate and quarantine people who can't safely quarantine at home, as well as housing those who are precariously housed. But, you know, things like income support, occupational safety and enforcement, you know, sick leave, which is really labor reform, and then addressing some of these systemic, both racism and other inequities, you know, related again, um, you know, to um, to what I've described, you know, is is certainly much larger than you know um, you know any public health unit would um, be able to um, to address. Finally, I'm just going to reflect a little bit on um, you know, do these descriptive data help? So you know, we we have um, given the report to the federal immigration ministry. They certainly were you know, interested and, um, you know, these were the first data that came out, but again, some of the policy issues for them actually relate less to permanent residents and much more to temporary um, uh, foreign workers um, and uh, from a policy perspective. We've been including some of the immigrant and refugee status um, demographics in our weekly reports. I don't think that's really having much of an impact, but we are working with specific public health units. They are working with local newcomer agencies, with community health centers that, that serve them and community groups. And really part of what we're trying to do is empower communities to request these data. Um, you know, and uh, we have technical skills to analyze them, but it really should be for, for their use to you know, advocate, evaluate um, you know, as things go. Um, and then I'll just leave you with these uh, you know, two quotes, which I think are really um, you know, important and you know, are everything that this talk uh, was about. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Gutman. That was really um, informative and also very impactful research that you and your team has put together. So thank you so much. We have about six minutes for the question and answer period. I have currently one question right now in the talk. What is the logic behind keeping the dates between the years 1985 to 2017 and not 2020? Thank you very much for that question. So that is unfortunately, um, uh, that was the last, uh, those were the last data that we had from IRCC. We were just updating our data sharing agreement. And so we, we just couldn't um, go recently. So we did this weird work around where we then looked at, we had an other newcomer category, which was those who have recently come to Ontario and um, uh, applied for an Ontario health insurance uh, plan, like an OHIP card, um, but we can't categorize that group. So they could be somebody moving from Manitoba who was born in Winnipeg, or they could be somebody, um, or they could be um, immigrants or refugees. So it wasn't a group that we could characterize. It was a group that had, um, you know, very high risk for, um, uh, for uh, uh, testing positive. And so we just received those updated data from IRCC and need to link them and then we'll be able to backfill it. And then 1985 is just the most remote data that we have. And I have to say too, it feels, you know, in some ways maybe we even went too far back, right? Do you really, you know, it's, um, you know, the, the experience of, you know, those who have immigrated recently is of course very different than um, those who have come, you know, 30 years ago in some ways. 
Thank you. And our next question is from Russell Bonaguro. And the question is, any idea how your results compare to other provinces? Uh, so no, because unfortunately, the, so there are um, at least uh, three other provinces that have done the same kind of data integration. So BC, Manitoba, New Brunswick, and I know that Quebec has a data system um, as well that's a little bit different. Um, and they have not yet um, done these analyses. We actually have a call with um, uh, people from the Ministry of Health in British Columbia next week. Um, we're happy to share our definitions and codes and um, you know, happy for um, you know, other groups in these provinces to work with their data um, um, to, you know, to look at the same, to look at these issues. Thank you very much. Oh, and the next question is from Charlene Ronquillo. And the question is, what are the plans for future use of these new categories? And then the second question is, will it continue post COVID and be used elsewhere? Yeah, so our, um, I mean, so many of us um, use these data, you know, for other, uh, other types of research. And what's very exciting is that our new data sharing agreement with um, IRCC uh, now allows, um, we have a mechanism at ICS for external researchers to uh, request um, data cuts um, and um, either have analyses done or they can do the analyses themselves um, through something called uh, Data Analytics Services, DAS, uh, on our ICS website. And through our new data sharing agreement, these data are now um, available, can be made available more widely. So certainly for any of you, if you're um, interested, um, you know, uh, that is definitely a, a mechanism if you're interested in um, accessing these uh, data. So we'll certainly continue to do work. We're now doing work around some of the more severe outcomes um, and we're doing a sort of deeper paper uh, you know related to the occupation um, the occupational piece um, but you know again I you know these data are uh, public data and important for you know um, many to to use okay I don't see additional questions does anyone want to maybe ask a question live oh actually we have another one here uh, to follow up from Beniku, uh, the question is, uh, your data shows that it is not the new uh, comers, but re radicalized people who are already living in Canada for some time and has more exposure and positivity testing to COVID. What is this? What does this mean? Um, so I don't know if that's what we've shown. So, I mean, I think what we have certainly shown is that immigrants, um, so immigrants from countries, and again, these are not individual level measures, but um, um, countries where a majority of immigrants would be racialized uh, here definitely have higher risks. So maybe say that, do you want to maybe just say the question again? Um, I, think, I think what you were talking about maybe is that, um, sorry, and I raced through this, the paper, the other paper, which was, um, I can go back, is, oh no, I'm not sharing my screen. Um, so the paper of um, uh, the preprint that I showed where they were looking at, um, you know, neighborhood levels, uh, neighborhood measure population and uh, new immigrants and other things. And what they showed is that when you put everything into a big multivariable model, the, the um, effects of being racialized um, are accounted for by some of the other neighborhood level measures. Um, and so, you know, which is, um, uh, Im, you know, important, but I think my point would be, you know, again, these communities, you know, just because you, to me, it's not about adjusting for these things, you know, these communities bear, you know, a number of communities bear a lot of these different um, risk factors and, and that's, that's sort of the point. So, yeah, thank you. All right, so it is uh, 4.30 and just gonna close. So on behalf of Ken COVID's team and network, we'd like to thank you, Dr. Gutman, for your time to present us on this impact impactful research. And just uh, just an update before we, we go, uh, the recording will be available on YouTube in about two to three days. And our next speaker series, and gonna be the last one for this year, is on December 15th, and the topic is on uh, COVID the COVID-19 pandemic and the tw uh, 2020 US presidential election. So another very interesting topic to end the year. And this will be presented by Professor Leonardo uh, Baccini. And I hope to see you all there next week and have a great evening. <laughs>